everybody out this morning. It's uh, a little on the rainy side, but uh, I think there's been a few Sundays it was pretty hot and we can't complain about it being too hot today, eh? So this time I'd like to just take an open and a word of prayer before we get started here. Our Blessed Father, we just thank you for this time that you we have of being able to come here. Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for our Lord and Savior dying on that cross and we know he rose again that we might have life and have life everlasting. Now, Father, we just pray that everything that would be said and done would here to be to be your honor and glory, Father. And we just pray that we would be the blessing that you'd have us to be. Now, Father, we just pray you'd help us to glorify you. We ask these things in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior. We have uh, the Gilbert family going to come and sing a few numbers. But before they do, I have a little announcement here. Um, next Sunday night, there will be a gospel singing at Edison Heights Baptist Church at 6 o'clock. And it's a drive-in service, the same as what we're having here. And uh, the sponsor, they'll be sponsoring Youth Unlimited is what they're, 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 they can't take our collection, but there'll be a box on the way out. So if you're not busy next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, you can uh, go to that. I think it'd be a great time for listening to some music there. So this time I'd just like to ask the Gilbert family to come up and bring us a couple numbers that they have for us. Get off together here in the rain as well, but we'll try and sing over there. Bill, it is good to be here. We can always thank the Lord that the weather's not always like this. If we lived in, in Ireland or, or England, then we can expect this all the time. But we've had a lovely month of very hot weather and a beautiful time, and it's nice to see the rain. I'm reading from Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, but I'm going to read a 21st century version of it. You'll recognize it, of course, as being more a little bit more up to date. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Dawson to Whitehorse, and he was ambushed by thieves and who stripped him of his gold and wounded him and left him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
Likewise, a pastor, when he arrived at the place, came and looked at him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Mexican, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So he went to him and bandaged up his wounds and set him on his horse and brought him to a hotel and took care of him. And the next day, when he departed, he took out two gold coins and gave them to the manager and said, Take care of him, and whatever you may spend, when I come, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. You know, many years ago, when the Golden Gate Bridge was being built, there was no safety device and 25 men actually fell to their death. It was decided to build a huge safety net at a cost of $100,000, but it saved the lives of at least 10 men. But the amazing thing is, is that the work went ahead 25% faster than before. The knowledge that they were safe left the men to concentrate their energies on the work that they were doing. The same happens today. The knowledge that we can be free from the uncertainty of eternity sets people free to concentrate on more worthwhile objects. In spite of the many security programs that we have and the in insurance that is given to us and unemployment insurance and medical insurance and disability insurance, people do not feel any more secure than days gone by, and especially now with COVID-19. People, of course, know that there's a one nagging fear in their lives, and that is, what is going to happen after I die? Where will I spend eternity? Though numerous efforts have been made to discredit the afterlife, yet only, you only have to listen to some of the programs on our media to realize that many people still really believe in it. In fact, in a survey taken in the United States, 50% of Americans did not believe in God. But 73% were quite sure they were going to heaven when they died. So they, There's always the problem, of course, that people are really troubled by this. And we see this many times where people, of course, talk about the invisible world or the afterlife or the unexplained or the death life and, and all those kind of things that tell us very clearly that people are still very much concerned about dying and eternal life. Numerous cults, of course, either deny the afterlife or they make it impossible unless you join up with their particular group. Of course, many people would, not, would prefer not to talk about it at all because it bothers them so much. So they either avoid it or they fill their lives with so much activity that they don't give serious thought to this very important struggle. There is more to life than just this earth that we live on. There is more to life than just these few brief years that are given to us by the Lord God himself. And the Jews in Jesus' day were no different than people today. Eternal life was just as big a problem to them as it is to us. And they still had the difficulty of knowing how to have eternal life. And they were even in a more serious problem because they didn't have all of the scriptures like we have today. Eternal life is something that God promises to those that will follow and obey him. And Jesus Christ came to our world to make that eternal life possible for us. And so as a result, we see this lawyer coming to Jesus and asking Jesus and putting him to the test and saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was a new man on the block and people were really beginning to feel that he was at least a prophet come from God 
and the words that he spoke were words that were true and that were eternal. And so this lawyer put two and two together and said, this is the one I've got to ask about this all-important question, and that is eternal life. So they challenged Jesus and asked him what was going to happen. Jesus responded in a very amazing way. And we see that he points out that it can't be earned and it can't be bought and we don't have to go to a special place to have it. These are all questions that come to people's minds today. But he said this very simple thing. He pointed the man to God's word. What is written in the law? How important it is to get the right authority when we find, are seeking help on any issue. Too many people look for too many answers in the wrong places. They are forever searching but never able to come to the right solution. When we have a problem with our car, we go to a mechanic. And when we have a problem, of course, with our sickness, we go, of course, to a doctor. It's important you don't get those two mixed up, so it is. But you know, that is exactly the problem, is that people go to the wrong places for the right answers. And Jesus pointed to God's Word as the only source of eternal life and the knowledge of how to be able to obtain it. In fact, there are no other scriptures and no other writings in all of the world that give us any sound truth concerning the afterlife. Because the Word of God is the way that guides us to that home that Christ has gone to prepare for us. God's Word is the light that shines upon the pathway of being able to find the right road. And we recognize that there is so much that God has shown to us in His Word to assure us of the certainty of eternal life and the certainty of being able to find it for ourselves. We fail so many times because we do not know what God has said. What is written, Jesus said, in the law? Well, God's word is very simple. We read in John 3 and 12 that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In John 4 and verse 14, we read, He that believes on the Son has eternal life. In John 17, Jesus said, This is life eternal, that you may know God, and that you may know Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. Nothing could be more simple and more profound in today's word than that simple statement that Jesus is the source of eternal life. And whoever has Jesus has eternal life as well. Again and again, the scriptures turn us to the one who was sent to our word to explain it and to make it very, very clear to us, and people can believe in him. Therefore, we do not take this vital question secondhand, as it were. And although there are millions of traditions and ideas and opinions, there's only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. Secondly, we notice that Jesus pointed to the heart and not to society. He says that you have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and body, and strength. This is a quote from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And it sums up everything that is said about the law and what the law taught in the Old Testament. In fact, we see that the many, many commandments given to the people in the Old Testament was really just a test of whether they loved the Lord God or not. Do you really love God, Jehovah? Or is there something else more important in our lives? Jesus said this is the real test whether we have eternal life or not. If we could obtain life as a favor from God, then we would only do, uh, follow Him as long as we obtained His favors. But it, what we see is that if we give God all of our love, then we recognize we are bound to Him for all of time. 
We know this when a young man says to a young lady, I love you and will you marry me? He doesn't fully understand that that means that he signed over everything that he owns. And, it's, and she does the same thing in return as well. It's exactly the same with God. When we say that we love God and we mean it, it means that we have signed over everything that we have to Him. And He gives us everything that He has as well. And it's a loving relationship that we are brought into. Therefore, we see that God has loved us with an everlasting love. It is only our response to say that, yes, we will follow Him or we will not follow Him. The importance of this love is reflected in the person that has done so much for us and coming to die for us on a cross of Calvary in order that we might have eternal life. Jesus Christ is the source of that eternal life. When we believe in Him, then we have life and we have it everlasting life as well. Of what use is the certainty of eternal life without the solace of enjoying the presence of God Himself. Many times people look for the place of gold and they miss out the very person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They look for the security of eternal life and they miss out the thrill of divine love that Christ can give to us. It is not where we are going so much for eternal life, it is who we have and where He is. It is a relationship that we have with Christ Himself. And if Christ is in us, as the Apostle Paul says, then that is the only hope that we have of eternal life. When God draws us to Himself, then He brings us in harmony with Him, and we give up what we are trying to do, and we cling to what He does. And therefore, because of that, we recognize that our love for Him is a full expression of the fact that He has given to us such a wonderful gift. William Dixon lived in Breckenthwaite, England, and he was a widower who had lost his son a number of years before. One day he saw the house of a neighbor that was on fire and the aged owner was rescued but then the son was trapped inside and they could see him in an upstairs window. William climbed an iron pipe on the outside of the window and rescued the boy but his hands were badly burned. Shortly afterwards they were set up a committee to try to decide who should care for the boy and several came forward with good credentials. But when William Dixon's turn came to speak and to ask for permission to look after the boy, he merely showed him his scarred hands and the boy was given to him. That is what Jesus does for us as well. How do we know that he loves us? Well, we look at those nail-scarred hands and we realize that He has paid the ultimate price for our salvation in order to give us eternal life. Thirdly, Jesus points to life itself and not to feelings. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. This is a quotation from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And again, it is the most vital expression of all that the law required. There was a Godward responsibility of obedience and love, and there was a manward responsibility of caring in love. How can I really know if I love God with all of my heart and soul and mind and strength? Well, by the way that we love and care for our neighbor. My life will show what my heart really is in love with. My deeds will give expression to what I would do for the Lord by what I do for my neighbor. My caring for others, of course, shows whether I care about the Lord Jesus or not. Jesus said, For as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You see, every single person on the earth is made in the image of God. 
They are a reflection of God's person. And therefore, to murder or to abuse, to curse, to despise, to reject or defame a person is to do the same to the very one who created them, to the Lord God himself. And this is the test of our real love for God. Is everybody important? Yes, everybody is important. Red and yellow, black and white and brown and every other color as well. Everybody is important because they are made in the image of God. And it, it means, of course, that we do not condone maybe what everybody is doing, but at least to their value, to their worth, to their personhood, they are in the image of God and they are a test of whether we love God or not. And so in 1 John we read, whoever hates his brother and says, I love God is a liar. For who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And John says very simply, he said, if we say that we love God, then we have to love other people just as we love ourselves. So the man raised the question very simply, he said, who is my neighbor? He wanted to get out from under the responsibility of looking after his neighbor. And so Jesus said, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, or Dawson to Whitehorse, where does not matter, and who the man was does not matter. But the first thing we notice is that the man was abused. He fell among robbers. This is the attitude in the world today of what is yours is mine, if I can get it. There are many robbers in the world today of all different kinds. Some that are poor and in need and others that are very rich and just want more. And sometimes it's international and national and sometimes it's local. But we see it at every level that robbery and thieving has become an epidemic. And everybody has this attitude of what is yours is mine and if I can get it, I'm going to take it as well. In one way or another, those without God live by this law. And so the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither the immoral, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor robbers? Jesus said, A person that robs another does not have eternal life. Their lifestyle shows that who their God is, and their God is the lover of money itself, that it is the supreme uh, attraction in their, their life, and therefore they are going to grab all that they can. Jesus said the second thing that happened to him was that he was abandoned. When the priest saw him, he passed by on the other side. This is the attitude of life that says what's mine is my own, and you're not going to get any of it. Both the priest and the lawyer or the Levite abandoned the needy man. It was the apathy of having enough for themselves and not seeing the suffering that other people are going through. Enjoying the blessings of God, but of course we see for ourselves and for our own pleasure what we abandon the oppressed and the widows and the innocent because the works of the flesh, of course, are pure selfishness. And, she, and, and Paul says to Timothy that that is one of the marks of the last days. He said people, of course, will be selfish. And in Galatians, he says it's one of the evidences of the flesh. There's no eternal life where there's no love for others because they have become lovers of self. And then we see third, the man that would abided with him, a Samaritan, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. It's very interesting, that word compassion is only used of the Lord Jesus Christ in any other place. And it's an attitude that comes from God where He sees our needs, He sees our problems, He sees the way we're going. Above all, He sees our destiny and He has compassion and He sent His only begotten Son to come into our world. That's why it is spoken of as the Lord Jesus Christ when He saw the crowds and the fact that they were like sheep without a shepherd, He had compassion on them. This is what happened to this Samaritan. 
he had compassion and so he stayed and he helped the man and he bound up his wounds and he took him to a place of rest and he cared for him and he paid for the expenses why because he was a Samaritan no but because he had compassion and obviously had a touch of heaven that nobody else knew anything about what a picture of Christ as he abides with us and he comes to us at the time of our need and our difficulty and he gives to us a life that is beyond comparison this is the attitude of God that is poured out into our hearts that we might know him that we might be able to find eternal life first we give our souls to God in love and then we give our life to others to help them that they might be able to find this wonderful Savior that has so captivated our lives. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what glory we may or may not give. It is simply the attitude that as we look at Christ on the cross of Calvary and the love that he poured out for us there, that he gave his life and all that he had in order that we might be able to find eternal life, then the only response that we can have is if ever I loved him, it is now. What a change comes into a person's life when human love lays hold of them and it changes their whole focus as well. The same happens with us as well when Christ comes into our lives. Our whole lives and our eternal future is dramatically changed. Love asks for nothing, but it gives everything. And by so doing, it captures our hearts and our lives and all of our actions. This is real Christianity as we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Has the cross of Christ so captivated your life that it has changed you dramatically from one of selfishness and one of self, uh, self-preservation to that of giving until we can't give any more. Jesus gave all his, all his all because he was the source of eternal life. And if we have Christ in our lives, then we know that he is the one who rules and reigns there. And that is the proof of eternal life that we have put our trust in him and we've asked him to be our Lord and Savior. You may not know what the fullness of eternal life means, but you must find it for yourself in order that you be safe and secure for all of eternity. God's Word says, I have come to give my life a ransom for many. And Jesus Christ came that we might find eternal life and that we put our trust in Him. We can't receive it by good works, but we can receive it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift of eternal life, a gift that not is to be tangible in any way by material things, but a gift that is because our lives have been changed through a new relationship with a loving Savior who cares for us so much that he's paid all the price of our redemption. Lord, we thank you for what you can do, and we thank you for what you are doing. And we pray that even this morning, in the quietness of this time, that we might just give our hearts to you if we've never done that, and that we ask you to be Lord and Savior over all that we are, in order that we might be able to reflect that light to others as we meet them from day to day. Be with us, we pray. We thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, that you would be with us through all the years of our lives, but also right into eternity as well. So we give you the glory and the honor, and we pray that you might truly work mightily in each and every heart, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.